Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, Rachel and I will be talking with Don Klein, president and founder at Klein Engineering and Consulting about the dynamic realm of structural health monitoring, exploring its profound significance, diverse applications, and the cutting edge solutions brought by Infrastructure Tech. I'm your co-host, Matt Cardle, And I'm your co-host, Rachel. Holland. Now let's jump into the conversation of the week. Welcome, Don. And could you share a bit about your your journey and what you do on a daily basis as the CEO of Client Engineering and Consulting? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Matt and Rachel, for having me this afternoon. Uh, it's great to be with you guys. Um, I have had a, uh, it's not not a typical journey in my career, I would say. It's very unusual. Um, actually, my BS degree was in aerospace engineering. And uh, I wow. went back to went back to school and got a master's in civil structural engineering from Virginia Tech. And my first job after um, after Virginia Tech was in a small well, kind of a mid mid-size consulting engineering practice, and you know, then then the economy went downhill, and I actually lost my job, um, and I landed with VSL. VSL is a, uh, and I was with VSL for seventeen years, sixteen or seventeen years. It was a great experience. Uh, VSL is a, um, they're a supplier and installer of post tensioning products. They're an uh, international company. Um, they were bought by a local, the, the U.S. operations was bought by Structural Group, which is a company that specializes in uh, repair and strengthening and retrofit of structures. They're a contractor. Um, and so my journey through VSL was quite varied. I started as a design engineer and then uh, worked my way through um, business development and you know, as a technical salesperson. And then eventually, after Structural took over, uh, I became the manager of all the East Coast operations for VSL. So um, I got a great uh, education there in terms of not just engineering, not just post-tensioning, but also just running a business, how you run a business. So um, that was a great experience. I learned a lot there. Uh, and then I started my own firm, uh, Klein Engineering, in 2006. And we've been doing well and growing ever since. Um, so a typical day here, I'm focused primarily on business development, bringing in the work. Um, I brought in a partner, Catherine Farley, a couple of years ago, and she's mainly focused on the operations side. I'm focused mainly on the business development side, although we do kind of cross paths a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm focused a lot on business development and also growing the company and you know building the building the company uh, and that type of thing. I am curious, um, also just based, we have a lot of like younger listeners and going from a bachelor's in aerospace to a master's in civil structural, is there something that like prompted you to do that? Yeah, I was working, my first job out of school was with a fairly large, a very large um, like government contracting company. And we were doing, we were doing work with uh, with the government uh, with uh, the Department of Navy. And, um, you know, it, it was pretty interesting. We got to write on uh, submarines and la launch missiles and stuff like that from the submarine. And that was kind of cool. But I just didn't see myself doing that for the rest of my career. You know, so that, might, that might be good for some engineers. That's a great career path for them. But I really wanted to be in a smaller company environment, you know, build something, design something, build it and actually see it come to fruition. And I, I really felt like civil engineering was the place for me. So I actually, after I worked there for two and a half years, I uh, decided to go back to school and become a structural engineer. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for, sh for sharing that little, little bit. Um, sure. I'm also curious um, at, in your, in your practice, um, have you been involved in evaluating and rehabbing concrete structures? Yeah, I said earlier we we focus primarily on design of new post tension concrete structures, but we another area of focus for us is um, 
evaluation, repair, retrofit, strengthening of existing structures, primarily buildings, but we also get involved in bridges as well. And um, we do a lot of that kind of work. And uh, we have s several engineers here at Klein Engineering and everyone's cross trains. Everyone can do both new design as well as evaluation, repair, strengthening of existing structures. Excellent. Cool. And I wanted to jump into, uh, I know there's some new trends going on in terms of uh, like, what is smart building and structural health monitoring technology? Like what's the state of the art of that industry? I know uh, that's getting more and more, more traction and, but yeah, what is that for, especially for structural engineers that may not know what that is or haven't been uh, familiar with it? Yeah, we all know that, especially concrete structures, um, they they do fine as long as the rebar and the re reinforcing steel in the concrete stays pristine and doesn't corrode. Once it starts to corrode, then it it starts to, uh, you know, it um, the the volume grows and it um, starts to spall and crack the concrete, and that's where we see problems. And um, they're really you know, there really is not a lot of technology out there for um, smart, uh, well, I would say smart building technology to monitor these structures over time. There are some products out there, like there's there's a, you know, corrosion sensor you can put in concrete that uh, that will show progression of, of uh, corrosion through the depth of the concrete, but it's, it's, a, it's a wired system. So you have wires coming out. Um, and there are products that uh, monitor the strength of concrete, which is being used more and more today. Um, there are products that that uh, monitor cracks, crack widths, growth of cracks, that sort of thing. But there's really not a, a you know a comprehensive method of of monitoring the structure over over the lifetime of the structure. Um, and so we got interested in that, and and we um, started looking for products overseas in Europe and we found the system and um, we got interested in that and we we started to develop um, a partnership with that company to bring it here to the, the US and I would say that it's a very the company over there is called um, Infrasolute and they're very innovative um, and they have some great technology and and we decided to, to partner with them and bring that technology here it looked like so for we have these sensors essentially that uh, throughout the life of the building, they can monitor any corrosion or cracking, or essentially the the structural the structural health of, say, the concrete slab or the structure to to make sure that there isn't anything wrong with it. Especially if the concrete's covered up, uh, you, I'm guessing you can yeah. go on your app and and see what it is or somehow pull the data, right? Yeah, the the way it works is um, I've actually got a couple of samples here um they're like there's two different sensors we use they're kind of like hockey puck size sensors one is a this one is a corrosion sensor and the way it works is it has a wire it has a series of wires around it um, the wire is um, made of a it's composed of a material that's very similar to reinforcing steel and so when the passive layer of protection goes away due to you know due to whatever it could be carbonation or just um chlorides getting into the concrete um the passive layer will go away and it'll start to corrode the wire and then once it corrodes then it'll send the signal to basically to the um the cloud letting us know the corrosion has started and then this and it also monitors temperature in the, in the concrete as well and then this one is a little bit different this monitors moisture so you can you can see when the humidity or the moisture content within the concrete changes over over a period of time so we like to use both of these products so interesting they, so so you pour like those are in the concrete when you pour it and they stay there for the life of that building yes there's a couple of different ways that this product could be used one is um you could put it into the concrete during construction, during original construction, um, and and then it'll be there for the life of the structure. These have been tested, and they can la in a, in a um, you know accelerated environment, and they have been shown to last over seventy years in a structure. 
Wow. So they, and they're, they don't have, they don't have, need any kind of power. There's no battery, there's no wire. Um, and so it will last a long time in the structure without ever having to go back in and, and check it. Um, that's one way that it can be used. You can also install it into an existing structure. You can core a hole into the structure. If you imagine like a column and you core a four inch diameter or five inch diameter hole, and then you pack this in with grout into that hole. It, it can work in existing structure. And a third way would be, let's say you're doing a repair on a structure, on a parking garage or a bridge deck or something like that, and you have a patch that you're working on, you can put this in the patch material and then cover it up with the patch patch material. So that's three ways that, that it can be used. Wow. So it can, I mean, you have the ability then to put it in new construction and existing and have it work for you in both cases. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's a really innovative product and uh, it can be used in different types of structures. Obviously, I mean, you have to think about different structures where that are at risk for um, corrosion and, you know, buildings, parking structures, uh, if you're close to the coastline, um, tunnels, bridge decks, you know, there's lots of lots of opportunity to, to use it. Tanks would be another op opportunity for using this. Interesting. So Don, you're you have this, I mean, you have these these products that seem to provide so much information. And I'm curious in your opinion, like why would you why would you say that structural health monitoring is so important? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, as structural engineers, we often get involved in in projects where we're going out and and uh, evaluating, we're inspecting structures, we're evaluating them, and um, you know when when the when the rebar starts to corrode, you don't really know what's going on in the concrete until you until you see it uh, manifest itself through cracking and spalling. Once you get to that point, the the cost to do the repair becomes uh, exponential. You know, if you find the problem before it uh, starts to spall the concrete, then you can take care of it much more economically than you can after you get the spalling. Once you get the spalling and the cracking, then it becomes very expensive to go in and, and remove the concrete and, and patch it. And so that's one reason. One reason is cost. Another is, um, well, we, we have projects very close. You remember the uh, Champlain Towers collapse, building collapse down in Florida. That was um, primary. Uh, that was uh, contributing. It was contributing factor that you had corrosion of the steel and the concrete. And um, if we had a system in buildings that could kind of uh, give us an early warning detection for for problems that are developing, um, that you know on these structures that may may not be monitored that closely by structural engineers, then that would give us more information to, um, you know, to improve the safety and, and mitigate risk on these buildings. Um, so there's a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you know, reduce cost going forward and also, say, you know, potential for saving lives in the future. Yeah, excellent. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and uh, what about the, so you, you mentioned they have the 70 year lifespan. And how how do they, I guess, how do you pull that data? Is it uh, looking at it or is it, yeah, I guess, how does that work in terms yeah. of how do you it's, get um, the data? <laughs> yeah, I'm a structural engineer. I'm not really a, uh, uh, I don't know, an IT guy, but there's a lot of technology that goes into these. So this, if you can imagine a uh, like a credit card reader, you go to the grocery store and and you, you tap it and it, it can read the information off your credit card. This works, this has similar technology. Um, this would be embedded in the concrete and then you would bring a, a reader on the outside of the concrete and it will, um, it'll extract the data from the sensor. Oh, okay. And that reader sends it to the cloud and it can be evaluated and, and manip manipulated by the, by the engineer or, or the, the asset owner, whoever is gonna be using that information. Um, now the, the reader can, there's two different types of readers. One, it, it can be mounted directly to the concrete and, and it'll be there permanently. It, that does need to have power. It can be powered by battery or by solar or by just hardwired. And that, that's, that's on the outside of the concrete, um, that we call that a gateway. And it would pick up the information from the sensor and send it to the cloud by using cell phone technology, cell phone technology. And, um, gotcha. Not radio waves, cell phone technology. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other type of reader is a, is a handheld 
reader. So you could you imagine you have a, a small portable handheld reader and let's say let's say they don't the owner doesn't want to have the box permanently mounted to their structure, then you as the engineer can you know take this handheld reader and go out there once a month or twice a year, whatever you decide, and um, and then pick up the data that way. And that that also will send it to the cloud and store the data. Cool. And uh, it looks like I know you were also involved in that startup company. I believe it was Infrastructure Tech or iTech. Is that correct? Yes. I. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I have uh, Catherine and I run Klein Engineering, uh, a structural engineering firm. I mentioned that. Um, she and I both are involved in this new um, venture called Infrastructure Tech uh, or iTech for short. And uh, we also partnered with, a, we have a third partner. His name is um, Yospani Balate. He is the owner of a contract contracting firm and they specialize in repair and evaluation and retrofit of structures, you know, actually doing the, um, doing the work in the field. They actually do the repairs on concrete. They also specialize in waterproofing. And we, we do a lot of work with, with Yospani and his team. His, his company is called Structural BR. Um, they are. He's also an engineer and very much focused on technology and how technology can can improve construction. Um, and so we we partnered with him in in this new venture, um, and we both together kind of stumbled upon this company, Infrastructure. I'm sorry, um, Infrasalude in Germany. They're based in Germany and also in in Switzerland, and we. Uh, developed a partnership with them where we're we're bringing that technology here to the United States. So we're we're very focused on both the engineering, the, the structural engineering side, and inclined engineering, and also developing this new company called iTech. Interesting. So okay, so you you kind of gave us the info on how you can like extract the data. Uh, so so you're the structural engineer. You have you have your other partner who's the person that can install these types of things, and then mm -hmm. you talked about how you can extract the data. So I'm picturing like um, you know, other structural engineers who specialize in in structural evaluations, ma maintain maintenance, repairing of buildings, things like that, and then also like. Like the other side of it would be like like facilities management firm kind of people, mm -hmm. um, or even like you you mentioned earlier, like the asset owner, right? So, uh, like, who takes in or like in your experience, who most likely will get that data, and like, do they work with you? Like, how does that process all sort of? I mean, if it's your building, does the data just come right to you as the SE, and as soon as you're triggered that there's a problem? I, I just, how does that all work? Yeah, that's that's a great question. With at iTech, we're going to be focused on you know developing the technologies and um, supplying the the materials, the sensors, the gateways, all the hardware that's required. Um, we'll provide engineering support. We will also install and uh, or provide installation support. But we don't necessarily have to do all of it. We we would. We, we could, uh, through client engineering, we, we could get involved with an owner where we're providing the whole the whole package, you know, from A to Z, we provide the, the technology and also the structural engineering component where you have to get the data and evaluate it and provide recommendations to the owner. Um, but I think the, the way that this will be used the most and the way we hope it's used the most is by, um, working with local engineers who specialize in this. They're, they're representing an owner or they are a facilities um, engineer, engineering firm, and they're working with many, many different asset owners. And they, they could use this technology. They could provide it to their clients as another option for uh, evaluation or, or monitoring, long-term monitoring of their structure. And we would work out an arrangement with these engineers, local engineers, where we would provide them with all the support they need, all the hardware they need, um, and also also have a have the data available for them. They would get the data, um, and we would provide it in in you know standard dashboards that they could they could look at on a regular basis. Uh, they can decide what is the frequency of the uh, of the monitoring. Would it be weekly, monthly, annually, whatever? And we we could customize that for them. 
We can also customize the, the interface with them. If they want to see the data in some different format, we can, we can uh, you know, develop our software to provide them with customized dashboards, for example. So we really envision the, the local engineer. Uh, this would be a tool, a, a tool in their toolbox that they could provide to their client. And then we would provide all the support they need in order to get them the information that they can use to better um, advise their clients. Um, so that's that's really the way we see that. Now, now, if it's a you know a larger asset owner like a like a DOT, for example, they have in-house engineers probably that uh, we could work with them to provide them with the information, that, the data, um, or it might be a consultant that's that's hired by the DOT. They would get the data. That that type of thing. That's how we see this this working. I don't really. I don't really think the uh, the general manager of a of a garage for, is going to be able to use this information necessarily. I think it needs to go to the structural engineers or the asset facility manager managers, and they would be able to provide the information or analyze the information and provide recommendations to the owner. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Like uh, to see how that all kind of like breaks down. Who's going to be watching it and who's going to be monitoring it and making those decisions. Yeah, and I also think it gives the engineer, engineering firm, um, kind of a reason. You know, engineering firms will go out and, uh, you know, they may be contracted to do regular inspections, maybe annual inspections or something like that. But this would give them more opportunities to interact with their client. So it might it might open up new work or, uh, you know, new, improve their relationship with their clients. Yeah, definitely. And provide, I mean, provide that additional service that's going to help with like the longevity of their building and all that. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I had, I just had two questions that, that, uh, that I had. So one was for, just because I'm in, I know you're, I think you're mostly focused in the, the East coast, but over here in the mm -hmm. West coast, I know we have a, you know, we have earthquakes and seismic. Do you think if there could be any applications to that, maybe uh, maybe ground motion sensors or building sensors, or even maybe in, in the East Coast, uh, ways to see if uh, the rebar or the reinforcing is damaged maybe during heavy winds or an earthquake? is Yeah, what, what do you think about that uh, in terms of sensors? Right. Yeah, I, I think, this is really just touching the surface, these sensors we're, we're working with. I can envision a future where you have technology that can go into a structure that will not just talk, not just give you the information about early corrosion or moisture entering the structure, but you could you could envision having crack monitors. Um, you know, think, think about a building that uh, the way we do it today, we, we design a building, to code and we uh, we build it and then we kind of let it let it do its thing for the rest of its life and then you we might inspect it occasionally but uh, wouldn't it be great to have a building that's a smart building that can give you information about how it's performing not not you know not just uh, every day but let's say in, a, in an extreme event like a earthquake or a or a high wind event or something like that you could have potentially you could have strain gauges that could be put yeah. into certain parts of the structure uh, on steel, or I'm not sure how it works with concrete, but certainly you could put it on the steel um, and then crack monitors. And you you would be able to get just a, a plethora of information that could be used to um, not just, uh, I mean, I can see all, kind, all kinds of opportunities. You, you could see how the, how the building is performing over, over its lifetime. But what if you had this on, you know, thousands of buildings, you know, maybe maybe more than that, and you were getting all this information in a central hub, um, how could that data be used to improve all sorts of things? It could improve the, the building code. It could be used to um, make predictions about how structures are gonna behave because you have this historical information that's come in from lots of buildings. So, I and, and it could be, you know, with the advent of AI, that could be used to, um, you know, to create algorithms that could use this data to improve how we 
how we build buildings and then how we maintain buildings over a long period of time. So I see a just a incredible potential for this type of technology. Yeah, it's interesting to think about all the different kind of ways it could take us. I think just, um, you know, on a more like today level, I feel like with things that we've learned in the past with with building collapses and things like that, it's so much is left to us with like a structural observation. You can only see what's going on on the surface and to be able to have something on the interior of that material and also like spitting out data that um, you know, you can create these dashboards and people can see like, this is where we're supposed to be. This is where it's performing. Like, clearly we need to do something now versus waiting and see, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's, it would be really advantageous to us as a, um, I mean, not only just our profession, but it's just like society, obviously, you know, and like the built yeah. environment. Yeah, there's all, there's all kinds of opportunity and potential for, for technology to be used more in construction. Construction is sort of a considered a you know, old fashioned, you know, there's not a lot of uh, innovation in construction. So we need to think of ways we can improve, improve it, improve efficiency, improve um, the safety, mitigate risk over a long period of time. So it's a lot of opportunity for improvement in construction. I was going to add about the, when you said about the smart buildings and putting sensors in, because I know uh, researchers do that for their tests, right? But they're very limited. Imagine if we had that data for actual buildings, we'd have that much more data points instead of uh, taking years to set up a, a building experiment in the lab. But it'd be so cool if they had all, all that data, not just in terms of seismic, but any type of damage or corrosion uh, to real life structures. I don't think you could get better data than that to, to the actual conditions. So <laughs> interested to see where it'd go. Well, California is kind of a mostly dry climate is it do you guys have much corrosion there i guess maybe in the some 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 areas you have coastal too like the coastal, coastal areas yeah. yeah we we have a lot of problems with that too i think mm. i think that's everywhere i mean yeah water bad yeah. <laughs> ocean. ocean yeah the ocean for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly and that that's one one thing that this can do let's say you have a plaza deck that has a membrane on it and it's supposed to stay dry this can tell you if you're getting if it, if it's if, if there's a breach in the in the waterproofing and it'll give you an early warning about that before it just creates havoc in your in your uh, plaza deck i i was gonna also comment that like the how you know construction industry is just a little bit like old school in terms of technology and I feel like um, I feel kind of excited about like our field, though, right now, because I keep hearing about all these really cool um, advancements and, you know, computer things and technology and all this stuff. I think that the 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 downfall that we have is that we're all kind of slow to adopt it in our industry. Like, I think the stuff is there. It's getting there. It's just it's a little bit slow to adopt. So. Yeah, you're right. Um I'm involved in um, some industry organizations like American Concrete Institute, ACI, and PTI, and things like that. And um, these are very slow-moving organizations, unfortunately. They, and they they tend to, and I don't think they do this intentionally, but they 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 don't like to promote proprietary products, and so it, it kind of uh, it kind of hinders getting new products on the market. Um, I would say that most of the, and from Simpson, maybe you would disagree with this, I don't know, but it seems like most of the innovation in construction comes from Europe and, or other places in the world. And we kind of uh, adopt it over time. I know post-tensioning, for example, was was developed in uh, in France by Fresnay and it was brought here uh, to the United States later. And uh, that's just one example, but uh, seems seems to be, that seems to be the uh, kind of the pattern I, I see. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of like simil similar trajectory of like mass timber, you know, it's kind of moved its way over yeah. and down. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah. that's pretty common. Yeah, it looks like there's, in terms of the innovation of the industry, it seems like there's a lot of players, right? It's not just structural engineers, it's owners, contractors, and then you have the committees for each and every trade, uh, every type of material. It's like there's a it's like a really big organization, and I, I feel that's probably one of the reasons why we're probably slower in the innovation uh, department 
And uh, I had one last question just for mainly for career advice in terms of maybe structural engineers. Uh, what, what advice would you have for, yeah, structural engineers, maybe younger ones or students that want to get into either you know, seismic or maybe not seismic, but evaluation and rehabilitation of of concrete structures or even some of this this technology that yeah, you're, you guys are coming up with? Um, I do have advice to give. There, there's... I would say there's a couple of different tracks that an engineer, a young engineer could ta could take um, if they are interested in repair of structures. One would be to go to work for a, uh, get a job with a, a firm, design firm that specializes in that area or a facility managing management firm that specializes in that area where they do evaluations, inspections, repairs, and and, and produce contract documents for contractors to go out and, and do the repairs. One thing I really love about this part of the industry is that, you know, if you're, if you're designing a new building, you have a building code kind of prescriptive and it tells you what to do. The thing, the thing I really like about repair is that you can be more creative and more um, innovative in your solutions and try to come up with some really cool solutions. So I think, it, I think it's a great place for young engineers to, to look for um, career opportunities. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's a growing industry. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot of op opportunity there for young engineers. So I was saying that there's a couple of different tracks. One would be that, that track and, and they could go to work for like the big guys like Wish Janney, um, Simpson Gumpert, people like that, or smaller firms like, like ours, Klein Engineering. We, we do a lot of that type of work as well. Um, the second track for a young engineer would be to go to work for a uh, repair contractor or a supplier. Um, you know, Rachel, you work for Simpson. I worked for VSL. Um, I know a lot of structural engineers that that go to work for contractors and um, and suppliers, and that's a great place to to learn the industry, to make contacts, to grow your network. Um, and there's lots of opportunity to use your engineering skills in, a, in that type of company as well. And uh, of course, I did both. I worked uh, at VSL and then I started my own consulting firm. So you can, you can switch back and forth. And I, I do encourage you to, or young engineers to, to explore the different options there. Um, that, there's a, like I said, there's a couple of different um, tracks. And um, I would also encourage young engineers to get involved in industry associations like uh, trade organizations like American Concrete Institute. If they're interested in repairs, I would recommend uh, ICRI, which is International Concrete Repair Institute. They have uh, annual meetings. They also have local meetings that, that young engineers can go to and, again, learn a lot and then you know, expand their, their network of people that they know. Yeah, I think that's that's it. I do have a little bit more um, uh, advice for young engineers as well. I would say that um, you know I always tell our young engineers here to to get out there and get involved in these industry organizations, expand your network as much as possible. I can tell you that when I was a young engineer and and I was working in a, in a you know smaller company or at VSL, I would be working with with peers in 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 uh, for the clients that we're working for like project engineers and project managers over time these these folks you know rise in the company i know some of those people that are now running companies and are ceos of companies so it's so vital to increase your network and get to know people and, and cultivate those relationships and because you just never know where that's going to take you uh in the in the rest of your your career it's great to have those relationships and then the second piece of advice I would like to give is, is that, um, and this is a mentor told me this a long time ago, if you gotta find something you love doing, if you love your work and you, you work hard at that work and you increase your knowledge over time, and um, it's, it's sort of a, a law of nature, you're gonna be very successful in your career if you do those things. That's all really great advice. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much, Don, for for giving your insights and the advice on that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you for for coming on again and uh, sharing it. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, it's been a pleasure, Matt and Rachel.
I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you can find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources or websites mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.